All right, everyone, we'll make a start. Good afternoon to you all. My name is Dr. Travess Moore, and I'm from RMIT University. I'm delighted to welcome you to this session on housing and climate, and also welcome to those who are joining us virtually. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians and the land which we meet here in Brisbane, but also the various lands in which the virtual participants are located. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Just some housekeeping, this session is being streamed and recorded and will be available for all delegates to view after the conference. Today we'll be taking questions both online and from the room after the presentations. For those joining us online, online please use the Q&A tab at the, right, at the right of your screen and you will also find a copy of any presentations on this page. For those in the room, if you wish to ask a question, we ask you to keep your questions succinct to enable us to get through as many as possible. When we get to the section of the session, please raise your hand and wait for one of our volunteers to bring the microphone to you and they'll be circulating around the room. Um, before I introduce today's presenters, I would also like to acknowledge the people who have lived experience of housing vulnerability who are at the conference, either as presenters or delegates. Your voices are important in shaping better housing outcomes for the future. Now to today's session on housing and climate, retrofit and circular economy perspectives. The way we design, construct and use our homes is a significant determinant in how they will perform from an environmental, social and financial perspective. In recent decades, new housing in Australia, New Zealand and around the world has been designed to perform to minimum standards and some minimum requirements for existing housing have been introduced. Some jurisdictions are leading in this space, others uh, are still kind of uh, falling behind a little bit. However, a rapidly changing climate means that new and existing housing will not perform well into the future. This will likely result in expensive retrofits and or increased consumption of energy and impact on the livability of our housing. The challenge is not just to improve the quality and performance of new housing, but in how we deliver large scale deep retrofit programs to existing housing. We need to make sure that this is delivered to everybody, including renters, public housing tenants and other low income households. Focusing on retrofit as a technical issue has been the kind of primary approach to date, uh, but this excludes some of the social considerations of retrofit. And there is a need to better understand the experience of retrofit if we are to successfully scale up deep retrofit over the coming years. Given the increase in consumption of raw materials for construction and maintenance and waste produced during the life cycle of a house, there is a need to address this as part of a holistic transition to sustainable housing. A circular economy uh, proposes a significant change to the way we use materials both during the life of a house but also at the end of life of, of the dwelling. A shift to circular economy housing will require a number of changes to the way we design and maintain our housing to ensure that materials can be reused at the end of life or the life of the dwelling extended. The session today explores these key ideas. The presenters today, we have Joe Noon who is the Director of Capital Programs with South Australian Housing Authority, who leads a team of wonderful staff to ensure new public housing is delivered across the state. The team has a range of long-standing construction programs to manage alongside recent new programs, including public housing improvement programs. We also have Rachel Trinder, who is the manager for waste minimisation and site clearance at Kayanga Ora Homes and Communities, the largest public housing landlord and urban development agency in New Zealand. The demand for public housing in New Zealand has never been higher, and I guess much like the case in Australia, and the organisation is using their scale as a residential developer to deliver transformation in the construction sector in New Zealand. Dr Sarah Robertson from RMIT was due to join us as well, but unfortunately a change in circumstances has meant that she is unable to join us. Um, luckily for the session, I'm a Chief Investigator on the project Sarah was to present on, and so I'm going to step in on her behalf. I'm a senior lecturer at the School of Property Construction and Project Management at RMIT University and my research focuses on exploring how we can deliver improved sustainability across new and existing housing. You'll find the speaker bios on the conference portal should you wish to know more. Uh, but now I'll hand over to our first presenter, Joe. Okay. Um, yes, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and their cultural beliefs. Um, I wanted to start to talk to you today a little bit about 
the broader topic of circular economy, but come at it from the practical point of view of, of energy in public housing and provide you with some examples today of some really practical projects that we've put in place um, in South Australia, um, give you a bit of a description of what we've done, um, and then perhaps through the, the questions we can certainly unpack um, what retrofit means, um, how you integrate energy and solar into that, and some of those complexities that come from it. Um, I also wanted to start at the very beginning and, and acknowledge, I guess we, we get to the end and we say thanks to our partners, and I wanted to start with that at the beginning of this topic. Um, this um, energy public housing um, is not something that we can do on our own, um, and I guess I just wanted to acknowledge the cheer squad in the back corner over there that have made some of this happen, um, but also uh, Scott from Department of Energy and Mining, um, Leon from Tesla, Will from Illum, um, the crew from Son and Batteries. Um, none of this stuff happens on its own. Um, that is probably my number one lesson that I've learned in South Australia when trying to do energy stuff in South Australia. Um, you need partners. Um, we've come at this, I guess, from the point of view of part of the reason we landed in batteries is probably the state's early adoption of solar um, has led us down the path in terms of, you know, people are installing solar all over the homes in South Australia and Adelaide. How do we get that benefit across to our public housing tenants? And I guess that's, in essence, the, the, the germ of the idea that I'm talking about today. Um, hopefully that works. Wanted to come at a place that is linked to kind of strategy and policy, because that's where my bones are from. Um, this is the elements of our draft asset management strategy, soon to be approved by the board. Um, focuses on four key pillars around growth and quality and alignment, but the one on the left-hand side there is the one that links us to what we do today. Um, and that's about resilience. That's about building homes that can sustain themselves in a changing environment. Um, I believe the slides are available, so we can, we can all get selfies later. Um, in terms of actions, we want to build climate smart homes in the future. Um, and, and the really big one there on the right hand side down the bottom, and that goes back to the concept of, you know, we all install solar panels at home and we get the benefit of it. Um, how do we get the benefit of that for people that are low socioeconomic that can't afford to put, you know, solar panels on their home? Um, and maybe as public housing entities, we don't want them to individually install solar panels on their home. Maybe we want to do that for them. Um, and we want to make sure that homes are affordable for people um, in terms of their bills and their expenses. But the other thing we know is that, and I, I can only speak for South Australia, you know, our flotilla of public housing homes is, is old. Um, and was built a long time ago. And so we know they are not great condition for temperatures. We know that they're hot in summers and we know they're cold in winters. Um, so how do we do something about that? That is, I guess, where we're working towards. Um, in terms of expanding that out, and I guess just provide you a very brief summary today, um, kind of five areas that we're focused on. Um, one is around, you know, what are we doing with our existing and recently built public housing homes. Um, we build those to six stars. Um, and the other interesting change that we've done is, is probably since about 2020, um, we haven't been putting gas in, in connections into our public housing dwellings. Um, interesting change, still can't understand how it happened in the organisation, but I think it's a really great thing. Um, and, the, and the last one that we've put in place in the last 18 months is to build them to silver, silver livable standard. Um, in terms of the future work, um, we're getting on the front foot in terms of our, our deadline for seven stars is October next year. Um, we're putting that into our designs at the moment for public housing. So when October comes around, hopefully we can cut some ribbons and we've got some seven star homes out there already. Um, and, and I guess we're in a process now where we're reviewing our design guidelines and that gives us the opportunity to push the environmental envelope further, um, but at the same time manage our finances and manage those construction costs that we've heard about this morning. Um, we'll spend some time talking a little bit today about our project, the South Australian Virtual Power Plant with Tesla. Um, we're into phase four of that right now. Over the next 12 to 18 months, that'll be complete and we'll see 7,000 public housing dwellings within the virtual power plant. Um, we are about to work with our partners in DEM about community batteries and how we can use that. Um, and, and then we talk about, you know, how do we install solar and battery on places that are group sites? 
Um, they are a challenge in terms of where you don't have standalone meters. Um, and that's where Will and his sole share product comes into it. And we can talk about that a bit more. And then the last thing I guess we're focused on is really about how you embed better for like practices in your ongoing maintenance practices. That's how you can make homes better for temperature. That's how you can make things more efficient. Um, I was, oh, this, I was, oh, hang on. I was going to play a video. I'm not sure it's going to work. Um, which probably means I have to talk about this now. Um, for those who, I guess this is, I have to channel this pretty hard now, um, virtual power plant, um, th the name is, I guess, what it suggests. Um, it is solar and battery on homes that are connected virtually. Um, it operates as a network. Uh, we have started off, and I'll, I guess I'll jump to the next slide so then you can see some of the stats, maybe. Maybe, no, nope. I'll keep going. Um, I guess we started off with a pilot of um, 100 homes. Oh, there we go. So we started off with a pilot of 100 homes. Um, that came from a place where the government gave Tesla a grant. Um, obviously, the South Australian government has an interesting relationship with Tesla in terms of you know, social media interactions that lead to a battery getting installed to help us out. Um, and then I guess somewhere in there, we land in a virtual power plant. Um, that expanded out to a thousand homes, um, and then more recently, and that required some, you know, some loan funding. Um, that expanded out to phase three A, which took us out to four thousand one hundred homes. Um, in terms of the financial viability for Tesla, I can say this: that it must work out pretty well because they've paid off their loans. Um, but basically, in terms of the description that was in the video that I'm really shortchanging you on, um, you know, people get a, people get battery and solar on their homes. Um, they get locked in then for rates of electricity. Um, and that's probably one of the interesting differences. Obviously, if you've got your home battery um, and you've got solar at home, um, you know, if you earn, you know, it's up to you to decide how much electricity you get. I, I know with mine, I'm, I'm close to, you know, being in credit. But on the, t on the virtual power plant scheme, it's a fixed in locked rate. Um, so the energy comes in and out. Um, it's about a 25% reduction over, this, over the standard kind of electricity rates in South Australia. Um, it enables, obviously, as we went back to to start with, and, and now I'm getting into electricity stuff, which is really kind of cool and nerdy, but um, we have a lot of solar in South Australia, and so what can happen with the batteries is they can obviously fill up and take um, extra electricity across the system, um, and then it can be discharged. Um, it also is really handy, particularly for our, client, our, our tenants, that have medical equipment because the, the batteries provide backups. Um, so when we do have unfortunate blackouts, um, then it provides coverage in that sense. Um, hopefully this one plays. I go. live on the disability pension, so every dollar saved is a relief now that I've got the solar. I'm quite proud to show my electricity bill, just to prove a point. I saw it on the news, couldn't wait to sign up. Ever since I've had the power wall, I always use the Tesla app. I keep on bragging to my friends because I want them to get the benefits that I got. Um, we've got another when we did hear about the virtual power plant, I was right on to it straight up. I just thought I'd won the lottery. My neighbour said that the power had gone off just before midnight. And we never felt a thing. We look forward to this summer knowing we've got the power security with the Tesla battery. My husband loves his gardening. We show him the app. He's just interested in knowing is the battery charged? It powers our entire home and once the battery is full, it feeds into the grid. It's sort of one less thing to worry about. I can see the virtual power plant being the way of the future. So a bit of a summary there from a couple of tenants in terms of, you know, savings um, and that peace of mind feature in terms of backups. The other, I guess, the other piece of the puzzle in terms of our relationship with the virtual power plant and Tesla is, is we don't pay for the installation. Um, that's done by Tesla. Um, so we work through um, asset assessment and we work through whether we can provide um, those homes to Tesla for assessment. At this stage, we're kind of in that range of... 60% of our homes we provided to them for initial desktop, de desktop assessment. Um, and then it makes its way through, you know, a range of assessments leading to a physical assessment. And then the, I guess the challenge for us going forward is around tenant conversion. Um, the, the arrangement with Tesla has one energy provider and obviously one set of prices. 
Um, and so that is, that is one of those challenges because people understand that they can get free power from solar and batteries. This is not really free power, it's discount, heavily discounted power. So that's one of our challenges right now. But what we've seen over the last 18 months, and I guess everyone knows this in their hip pocket, is prices have gone up further. Um, and so we've seen a rapid expansion over the last 12 to 18 months in terms of who wants to join onto the VPP. Um, the challenge with the VPP is it needs, you know, meters that are separate from each other. And that kind of leads us into the second part of my talk today, which is, and I guess we've all, for those of us who are public housing or community housing, we've got sites that have got group meters. We've got flat sites that are clustered. How does solar and battery solutions work for those? Um, where I wanted to start from, I guess, is these are some slides. These are some befores and some afters. Um, these, these are what we call walk-up flats. They're kind of two, three-story flats. Um, we've worked through over the last few years around redeveloping some of those features, uh, those flats. Um, I guess it kind of goes to the circular economy argument in terms of making sure we're not building everything new. Um, and where that led us to was we did full refits on these buildings, um, double glazing windows, um, had to remove asbestos roofs. Um, and when we got to the end of that, we, you know, I guess I don't know what your policies are, but our policy is we don't install air conditioning. We wanted to install air conditioning in these places. How do you offset the cost of air conditioning? Well, let's put solar and battery on. Um, and so that led us down the path um, to uh, the software solution. That led us to SoulShare. Um, the guy in the middle there with the dark colored polo shirt on and the hipster haircut and the mo. Um, have a chat to Will. Um, his product is SoulShare. It's an Australian product. It's unique. Um, it's pretty bloody cool. Um, it sits behind the inverter and basically it shares the solar um, and the batteries across each of the buildings. So we've got one of those set up at each of these. Um, we've done five sites now. Four of those are refurbs. One's a new apartment building. Um, and it shares the solar and battery. I think I'll, I'll leave the technical details to him to, you can go and see him afterwards about that, but it splits it out. On the right hand side there, you can see um, what some of those kind of usage graphs do across some of those sites. Um, green being total energy consumption, light green being um, where solar's kind of kicking in. So these are fairly small units. Um, these are really small two bedroom units. The power consumption on them to start with isn't very much. Um, we, as part of the refurbs, whilst we didn't have aircon, um, most people had those kind of wall-mounted rattler kind of air conditioning units installed. We've replaced those with virtu um, res reverse cycle air conditioning, and that's brought that consumption down. But now we've got solar and battery as well. So um, really good solution in that sense for a site. And then there's a bit of a slide here about some of the lessons we've learned out of it. I'm not going to get into the details too much because I think I'm running out of time. Um, but we can have a discussion during the Q&A about some of those lessons we've learned along the way. So thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Um, so going to change tack uh, a, a little bit here and um, uh, I, I really enjoyed Joe's presentation there and absolutely agree technology is going to play a significant role moving forward. Um, but what we've been looking at in some of the research we've been doing at RMIT is the role not only of technology and materials but the consideration of the social element within retrofit. Um, and the kind of the challenges or the opportunities that that then reveals in terms of trying to scale up at the levels that we will need to deliver um, between now and kind of 2050 when we need to achieve that low carbon future. Um, so as I said, my name's Traves. I'm standing in for Sarah today, but we also have a wider research team 
um, Nicola, Rolf, Bavna, Lisa, Emma, and, and others have all contributed to this, uh, this research. Um, I'd just like to start by acknowledging the people of the Wurrung and Wurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations whose unceded lands RMIT conduct their business and respectfully acknowledge ancestors and elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so this will not be a surprise to many of you, but the majority of our housing uh, was built in Australia before the introduction of minimum performance requirements for, for new housing. So we're talking about 8 million plus houses that are not fit for purpose. And I would argue that much of the new housing as well probably doesn't meet the needs of the, uh, the kind of the future climate conditions as well as some of the other kind of challenges that we have with our housing. And so we have a really poor quality housing stock and this will need to play a significant role uh, moving forward in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also in terms of improving people's health and well being outcomes, improving their livability outcomes and improving their affordability of their housing outcomes. And we know that retrofit and particularly deep retrofit can significantly improve uh, on, on all those things there. So it, it is going to be a challenge, but we know that this is going to be a significant plank in the housing space, the decarbonisation space and a number of addressing a number of other issues moving forward. Um, one of the, the kind of the key challenges we have as well and which kind of framed our, our research is the emergence of fuel or energy poverty in housing in Australia. And while this has been around to some extent for, for a long time in Australia, it's certainly, I guess, risen to the fore as we've seen rapidly increasing prices of energy over the past kind of 10 or 15 years. Um, but it's not just those people who can't afford energy, it's those people who are making trade-offs to be able to pay their energy bills, um, as well as those who are floating kind of near energy poverty so they might be just struggling along and so the percentage of people in and around that that space continues to grow and this is a really significant challenge but again retrofit is one of these things that can help address this um, so you know building upon what joe was saying absolutely technologies like reverse cycle air conditioners uh, and other types of appliances heat pumps uh, solar batteries these types of things are going to be a significant um, element within deep retrofits, but also we know that we need to improve the thermal performance of our building envelopes as well uh, to make sure that we can you know, reduce the requirements for some of those technologies. So if we make our, our housing thermally better, uh, we can put smaller air conditioning systems in there, we're going to use less, less energy, these types of things. Typically policy responses have focused on the technology and putting technology into people's houses, even if that's not the right thing to do. And as you'll see in a moment's time, we have a quote where the kind of the wrong technology was put into to somebody's house. Um, and so what we need to do, or what we're arguing for, is that we need to consider more of the social in the, the kind of the retrofit process to make sure that we're delivering outcomes that people want and that match their requirements, but also that we don't get pushback from people um, who, who might feel like they're co coerced or pushed into to some of this retrofit activity. Um, we also know that those programs of support, those rebates and, and so forth, are typically targeted to those owner occupiers or those who have significant wealth. And so there's a significant percentage of our population who can't access those schemes um, or find them too, too difficult to access. And so this is creating another issue around kind of what uh, the kind of my colleague Nicola uh, is terming the kind of the retrofit poverty issue that we're starting to see emerge here. And we saw it, I guess, to some extent with the, the rollout of solar PV in Australia, where it was largely the middle and higher income earners that were able to take that up. We're probably seeing that in the battery space. Um, you know, we're seeing it in, in other sustainability spaces as well, such as EVs. Um, and so the, the question kind of comes back to how can we make sure those who are most vulnerable in our community, those who are people like renters, low income households, those who are in public and social and community housing, how do we make sure that they can get access to deep retrofit? Because we know that they're probably in some of the worst quality housing, but are also likely to have other vulnerabilities, health and wellbeing and so forth, which will be enhanced um, through retrofit. So we need to make sure that they are included. Uh, onto the, our research project, and it is theoretically coming to an end in the next kind of six months. We're in that, that phase of kind of thinking about what does it all mean for policy and practice and, and these types of things. But this was a three year ARC linkage project um, called HEAT, Housing Energy Efficiency Transitions. And really we, we did a number of things, but one of them was more than 130 interviews across Victoria and South Australia with people where we spoke to them about kind of 
quality and improvement of their homes, not necessarily retrofit. We didn't want to bias the discussion to begin with, but largely our interest was around kind of how they maintain their house and how they undertook or engaged with retrofit activities. Um, that included also tours of, of their homes. Uh, and we've also interviewed people across the retrofit industry as well. So trying to get a kind of a really good holistic picture of what's, what's happening there. Now, what we know is that the kind of the retrofit, retrofit space is quite complex. There are a range of actors involved, obviously starting with the household uh, in, in most cases. And so the household are making a, a, a proactive decision to do something or receiving some information to prompt them to, to do something. Now, it's a little bit different kind of in the, the rental housing, the social housing, public housing space where it may be others making that decision. Uh, we also know there's different types of retrofit. There's retrofit for the kind of the DIY approach that people can do things themselves through to getting in professionals. And those professionals, there's a whole range of different trades out there that, that are involved. We also have a growing industry around providing information to households, so energy assessors and, and so forth are becoming increasingly important in this space, as are retailers. So we're seeing uh, the kind of the increased performance of appliances, for example, uh, and, and the benefits that that provides. And obviously, governments play a significant role in this space. They have done and they will do moving forward as well. Um, and, and landlords, 30% you know, or so of our housing in Australia is rental housing. And so there is a really significant and important opportunity there to make sure that we bring landlords in and address that, that housing. So just some kind of really high level stuff coming out of the project, I guess, uh, in, in talking to households, it's really clear that it is a challenging process for, for many households to go through and, and undertake retrofit. And many really struggle with kind of where to start, where to get trustworthy information, um, who to talk to, even understanding the benefits of retrofit is, is challenging for many people. And so they just don't really have the time, energy and effort in many cases to properly understand why retrofit's required. But then also when they decide to do something, it's often you know, the easier things that they can kind of access and it's often one-off of things that they might do rather than going through a deep retrofit process. One of the challenges is that you know, we have a, a, a disparate retrofit industry in Australia where peop different stakeholders are doing kind of one or two retrofit activities. And so if you do want a deep retrofit of your house, it often requires you to go out and talk to, you know, three, four, five different um, parts of the industry and try and get three, four, five different quotes from each part of the industry. Uh, and that certainly takes a significant amount of time, energy and effort again, but also to sift through and try and understand what that, that information means. Um, and there are some, some concerns out there in terms of the trustworthiness, I guess, of some of the players in the retrofit space. Um, renters in particular felt there was a lack of agency. And as you can see in the top quote there, um, you know, the, this householder is talking about the fact that they felt their landlord was just either not going to engage or if they were going to engage by putting solar on, they were going to put the price of the rent up. Um, and so we heard this time and time again, that concern about their kind of... Um, that power imbalance there between renters and landlords, um, but also in terms of making sure we're not just rolling out the one size fits all approach. So you can see the quote at the bottom there, social housing renter who had a split system put in, even though there were holes all around their house and the split system probably wasn't the first thing or, or the best thing to be done there. Uh, in terms of opportunities for, for scaling up, and I think we do need to be thinking, you know, how do we roll this out uh, at, at large numbers and, you know, even, the stuff that Joe was just talking about then, you know, going from 100 to 1,000 to 3,000 is kind of the evidence uh, around that we can scale some of these things up. Um, but how do we do this uh, across all housing types and across Australia is a really problematic challenge still. Um, and uh, we clearly don't have that independent quality, transparent and accessible information that we see some other jurisdictions have. So uh, energy performance certificates, even though they are criticised across Europe, are one attempt to try and provide people with more consistent and clear information at point of sale or rent, but also to use that information to prompt things like retrofit activities. In recent years, we've had the scorecard come to the market, and I think that that's a, a really good step forward, but making sure more people can access that, but also making sure that it's those lower income people who can access that as well is really important. Um, clearly, 
we were told time and time again that the retrofit industry or the building industry as a whole needs to have more of these soft skills. They need to be able to go into somebody's house and talk to them and understand what they want rather than telling them what they're going to deliver, um, particularly when it's often the, the, the kind of the female in the household who's trying to have these conversations and often feels either threatened or like they're being talked down to and makes the whole process quite, um, quite stressful for them. Um, we need to make sure there's improved protection for, for renters and I think that some of the stuff that happened after COVID-19 or during COVID-19 protecting renters uh, has extended now into kind of prote protecting any requests for quality and retrofit improvements, which is good to see, or at least in some states. Um, we need to make sure that uh, landlords are accessing and engaging in the, the rebates that are available for them. We know that there's quite a lot of options out there for them, but for some reason, they're not being taken up in the same level. Uh, and as across the industry, we're talking about, you know, can we get more of these one-stop shop type retrofit outcomes to try and uh, drive outcomes there? And we really need to make sure we continue every time we're talking about retrofit to think about the householder and their experiences to make sure we're not going to get pushed back. Um, final slide, uh, I th may have touched on, on some of these things or, already, but I think one of the key things to, to think about is the need to shift our framing around retrofit to include the social and financial outcomes. And I think that changes how we talk about retrofit. It's no longer just about environmental outcomes, but we're doing this to improve people's affordability, uh, livability, health and wellbeing, these types of outcomes. And I think that you know through this kind of uh, process, uh, through this social consideration, we can start to normalise retrofit. And so no longer is it just about, you know, how do we make our, our, our house, you know, more shiny, more blingy, but actually how do we make it function better? How do we make it better, not just now, but into the future? Uh, and, and that's a, a really significant challenge we, we focus. And this is going to require change from everyone, from policy makers, from people in the industry, but also households as well are going to need to, to shift and change there. Um, so thank you for listening today. Um, happy to chat about any of those things later on, but I'm going to hand over now to Rachel. Last speaker of the session. Um, I'll try to keep it interesting and um, keep everybody engaged because, um, I mean, there's some fantastic work going on, but I believe what our organisation uh, is doing is equally um, really outstanding in terms of broader outcomes and environments. So, um, kia ora everybody. Um, I'm, I'm Rachel Trinder. I'm from Kaying Order Homes and Communities. We're um, a social housing provider in New Zealand. Um, and thank you very much for having me uh, to speak to you today. Um, it's really awesome to see actually so many people that I assume have a common interest or um, you know, passion for environmental and um, you know, waste minimisation, circular economy and the construction um, sector. Hopefully I get the instructions correct. So um, Kainga Order uh, Homes and Communities we are New Zealand's largest social housing um, provider, or landlord, with over 70,000 homes, um, assets, homes, um, and house over 200,000 families. Um, housing is still uh, in high demand, a big, big issue in, in our country, um, and so we're actually undergoing a really big um, urban development or redevelopment program, um, the biggest in decades since post um, the World War, actually. Um, and as a result of that, we've created a waste minimisation program. <clears throat> We're clearing around 1,200 sites a year. So 1,200 sites have been earmarked for redevelopment um, and those existing assets on those sites, um, we've decided that we need to do, we have a responsibility environmentally um, not to send these to landfill construction and demolition waste in our country, I'm not sure about, about here, actually contributes to about 50% of all waste sent to landfill. So we really believe we have an obligation to change this, um, not only for, for ourselves, but our future generations. It's, it's not only um, the right thing to do, um, it, it is the only thing to do. We have created, as I said, our own waste minimisation program. I'm the manager of that program. Um, and yes, in order to build more sustainable um, construction and demolition practices, 
we have adopted what's called the waste hierarchy. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. But ultimately, um, what that means is, and we're talking about site clearance only, clearing uh, houses that would formally be demolished, um, we are aiming to relocate houses first, rather than just sending in the diggers and, and all of the material going to landfill. Now, we can't relocate everything, of course. Um, typology and construction um, does, does matter, access to sites and those sorts of things. But through um, development of policy, um, we have uh, embedded across business as usual that we will aim to relocate all across our country, houses as the first um, option. If we're not able to do that, we will move down the waste hierarchy to deconstruct, where uh, buildings are uh, pulled apart carefully uh, where materials can actually be reused, they're not damaged in, in, in the process. Um, of course, we won't be able to save everything and, and a lot of the material won't be suitable. Um, so followed by deconstruction, we will still demolish, um, but we've put landfill diversion targets in place so that um, we're still diverting stuff from the landfill. Um, so we haven't only just rolled out or adoption of the waste hierarchy, we've put in place the policy that I spoke about, and then to actually carry out the physical work. Like I, I heard um, in the earlier session talking about not a one-stop shop or cookie cutter uh, supplier that can actually roll out the whole service. Well, that's what we've done, is we actually went out to market and put in place the New Zealand's first, um, what we call site clearance panel. So we've got contractors that, that can relocate the houses for us, contractors that can deconstruct them and abide by our, our landfill diversion targets. Um, and also we pulled our demolition contractors across. So through doing that, we could create you know, the, the contract type that we needed, um, you know, reporting requirements so we can track what's happening to materials um, and, and, of course, achieve, achieve these landfill diversion and relocation targets, which are, and I have to reiterate, that these are targets uh, based on uncontaminated waste by weight. We can't help what we do. Contaminants exist. Um, horrible thing, and actually in, in our country there's not really any solution for where these can go. So, so the first target across deconstruction and demolition is the 80% landfill diversion target. Um, and I will talk about what we achieved last financial year um, in relation to that target. Um, that's in our biggest city, Auckland. And then as we go through the other parts of our, um, of our country, the, the target was lowered um, because of different infrastructure capability, but we've got to start somewhere. Um, and so that is 60% landfill diversion. Um, and the last target is the house relocation target, which is 7%. So based on that policy that we set, um, the targets that we've set, uh, and a dedicated team, my amazing team that you'll see uh, up there, and one of our deconstruction partners, um, and through, through um, our delivery teams that are doing this work for us, we um, are achieving some really awesome stuff. And what's great about it is it's tangible. All of it's measurable. We've got all of the data and information to back up what's happened to the materials, um, and that's why this program's getting a lot of momentum and attention, because that information, that level of detail, just simply didn't exist um, in New Zealand. So last financial year, what the relocation program achieved, we actually, um, the houses that we relocate, we sell them to those in need for a dollar, uh, and then we contribute to the transport costs to their site, um, and that own, not only is the best scenario in terms of waste minimisation, um, it's reuse, it assists with a whole bunch of broader outcomes that, um, that are really important. Um, giving people access to houses for a dollar who ordinarily um, wouldn't ever you know, look to own a home, um, provided they, they have land and infrastructure on that land. We managed to um, sell 100 of these last year. Now, prior to that, the default position was demolish and everything go to landfill. So we've really turned that around, and I think that's a number um, that you know, we are proud of, and that will incrementally increase year on year. So we also, um, the target was 7%, but we achieved 16% last year. So we've bumped the target up to 10% this year, and we'll continue to grow. Um, yeah, achieves two things. It's those broader outcomes, but the environmental outcome. Um, so 
so many benefits just out of that one change of course of action. Across our deconstruction and demolition activity, so where I talked about the um, landfill diversion targets, the biggest city, the central city, Auckland, um, last year we achieved 86% landfill diversion. That equated to over 30,000 tonnes um, diverted from landfill. Um, and we, we have tracked all the different types of material, what was disposed of, what wasn't disposed of. Um, and when I look back at where we were several years ago, um, you know, this is measurable, it's tangible, and it's making a real difference. Um, we really want to see others, others follow suit, um, and I'm sure that they will. Um, and in, in the regions where we had a 60% target, we achieved 75%, so uh, over and above uh, what we you know, anticipated to, to reach. Um, I thought I would share a case study. Um, this is, it makes me quite emotional actually seeing this because this makes the work meaningful. Um, up on the screen we have Cody who's a new homeowner. Um, Cody uh, never thought that she would own a home, um, has, has access to land because Māori land uh, in New Zealand, a lot of them have land and they can have a licence to occupy um, and are able to place uh, housing on that land. Cody found out about our programme um, and she absolutely jumped at the chance. So we, um, she brought the house for a dollar, signed a contract, we transported the house up to her land. Um, we have other uh, government sectors or agencies putting in infrastructure and things like that. So it's definitely, we can't do it on our own. It's a, it's a combined approach. Um, but it's her forever home now. Uh, there's a photo of Cody's son giving um, uh, Rob, who works for us, uh, the dollar for the house, saying, "This is my home now." Um, but it's it's this is what it's about. Uh, this is the you know the, the broader outcome stuff that um, over and above waste minimisation um, that we're seeing. So long may that continue. I also thought I'd share a case study on deconstruction. Um, so we have as part of the. the panellists of contractors we put in place to carry out this work for us, an organisation called Trow Group. They, um, when you deconstruct and you're trying to divert waste from landfill, you are only successful if there's an end market for the material. Trow Group actually send a lot of their material over to Tonga. Tonga have different building codes, um, you know, a bit more relaxed, I think they're, you're allowed reuse material and new construction. Um, and so a lot of the, a lot of the timber and, and material goes over to Tonga. Um, it's, it's used to help build in cyclone prone areas or rebuild cyclone prone areas, but also in terms of teaching students how to um, construct furniture and things like that. So this material has a new lease of life. Um, we're trying to you know, cr create more end markets in New Zealand so this can continue, um, but I thought this was a really awesome case study to, to show what some of the organisations we work with are doing with um, the material out of our houses that would ordinarily have gone to landfill. The last case study I wanted to share was again with another one of our deconstruction partners. We held, or well they held, a community salvage day um, where the community through our social media channels, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, all of those um, media types, were told about a community salvage day where they are able to come, uh, come along and um, materials are on offer for them to collect and take home. We gave away around 400 to 600 square metres of insulation enough curtains to furnish two average size houses, um, 15 kitchenettes and 18 ovens and heaters. I mean, for, for some people, um, it absolutely made their day. They had over 150 people attend, and um, it just goes to show, if you put a little, a little bit of planning and thinking into your project up front, um, it is possible. It is possible to achieve um, some of these outcomes in terms of waste minimization. And lastly, I just had to throw this in, in there. Um, you'll see a lot of awards and very happy faces um, because we are being recognised through this work in New Zealand. Um, we have a public service commission uh, in New Zealand, which um, basically any public servant, you know, works into those codes of, codes of ethics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we were a finalist in the Abroad Outcomes Award. 
we actually won our New Zealand Procurement Excellence Awards, both the Supreme and um, Environmental Impact of the Year Award, because our deconstruction and relocation panel was the first of its kind in New Zealand, and look at the tangible stuff it's achieved. I just mentioned, you know, the 30,000 tonnes, etc. Um, and we also won a, a Zero Waste Award as well. Um, and we are, So that's just last financial year. Um, and then next month in November, we're a finalist for another award. So we're getting the recognition. Um, we truly believe in this work. Um, and we really hope that you know, other Crown agencies will follow suit, which they're starting to. And that's our programme. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel and Joe. Um, we might now open it up to some questions from the floor. Just wait for the microphone. Hi, I'm Priscilla Tran from City West Housing in Sydney. I had a question, I've got two questions, but I'll ask one and then come back around no, if there's no, an opportunity. Uh, first question's for Rachel. Um, obviously the session's focusing on retrofits, but I'm curious to understand from your perspective, uh, lessons that you can transfer from retrofits into new builds and how we design and construct um, new builds to ensure waste minimization, not just during construction, but also during the life of the building, as well as when that the end of that time of the building, when it's time to uh, either deconstruct it or, or demolish it? Yeah, sure. Um, look, I'll just start by saying I'm not the expert in the, the retrofit um, space. We do have a retrofit team and we're doing, oh, we've got some kind order people here, around 700 a year retrofits, is that about right? Yeah, so um, we are doing we are doing them. Um, in terms of new construction, we do, so phase one of our program was site clearance, relocation, deconstruction. Phase two is focusing on construction waste. And we're starting at designing out waste. And so we're looking at, um, some of the things that we're doing is actually looking at the process or how much due diligence goes into the retrofit or retain option when developing a, a business case, we will be looking at introducing targets for construction waste moving forward. The only thing we have in place at the moment is Homestar. I think you guys have something similar. You're building to a six star yep. green. Now this, yeah. Right? So, so we have this, the same uh, where they have to divert, I think it's around 60% from landfill, but, but that's not solving the problem up front. Right. That's just once it gets to site. So. OSM, modular, um, that for new construction, you know, that, that theme's coming through quite a lot. Um, but yes, there, there's definitely, designing up waste needs to happen, you know, waste minimisation needs to happen in, in, at the design phase. So we don't know if that really answered your question, um, but that's what we're doing anyway. Just to add to that, obviously the circular economy session tomorrow, we'll be able to go into that in a lot more detail as well. Ask you a second question. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Come I'll speak on. loudly. Everyone's coming. Uh, so my second question, uh, you were mentioning lessons learned. Yeah. So here's the opportunity for you to share your lessons learned. And um, also I had the, uh, the question was around um, passive house. Uh, I've only recently learned about it myself, um, but passive house being, uh, I guess, a system coming out of... Uh, passive house coming out of Europe. Yep. Um, and I'm sure for those of you who are actually working in environmental sustainability, it's probably something that you're more familiar with, but um, one, if you could describe that um, to... No, I'll no, leave you that can't. up to you. Uh, okay. Well. <laughs> um, so I think Passive House is a, a system of, um, of measuring sustainability um, and particularly things like thermal comfort, and it's a bit yep. different from things like um, Natters and Basics, yep. which uses a... Um, I guess a, a standard model to work against, yeah. but um, it's different in that it tests it for your particular site and for your particular design and requires you to test the design to, um, conf uh, to confirm the assumptions yeah. uh, made during the design. And it's, a, it's an iterative process that takes more time and probably costs more money, uh, but it ensures the actual outcomes that you want for the, the occupants at the end of the day. Um, and it's something that is probably more common overseas, um, has started out of Europe, um, has gone over to North America, um, and it's only just started in Australia. Yeah. Um, uh, my understanding is that uh, Australia's a bit behind in this yeah. regard, and I'm just curious to see what your thoughts were 
on um, how we can implement that more in Australia and have the conversation around that as opposed to, uh, I guess we're only just still talking about Natus now and upgrading yeah. it to seven stars, but what does that really mean? There's so many ways to answer those multiple questions that you've got in that second question. Um, I mean, you know, as I said in my talk, we, we're in the process of redoing our design guidelines. So I'll go away and have a read about Passive House now and how we implement that. I mean, I think, I think the questions about Nathers are, are, are valid and I think we've got to understand what does that actually mean for the occupant of the house. Um, I think the retrospective element is the, is the component that I guess we, we think about the least. We think about seven stars and we're going to build new homes to it. Um, you know, in, in my case, over the next three years, we're building, you know, 1,000, 1,200 new homes, um, but we've got, um, across South Australia, we've got 47,000 existing social housing dwellings. So how does seven stars relate to that? You know, and I, and I think that's, that's the bit of the iceberg below the water. Um, certainly the Commonwealth's dipping their toes in it at the moment in terms of working some things out for states to try in that space. Um, and one of, um, one of your colleagues on your talk there, Emma Baker, has certainly done some work in South Australia assessing what hypothetically, you know, some of our 70-year-old homes would be. Um, and they're not great. And, 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 and so the challenge is how do we, how do we lift those up? Um, I think the really the interesting lesson, and, and I take it on the chin in terms of chucking appliance in places when they're leaky like a sieve, is really not helpful. Um, and so draft proofing and insulation is the place that I would start. Um, back to your first question about the overall lessons of our projects. Um, the big one is find partners that want to work with you. Um, the second one would be understand why you're doing it. I think it's really important and, and obviously there's some intersections of some ideas out there right now. There's a whole bunch of climate things, there's a whole bunch of carbon things, there's a bunch of stuff around affordability. Um, can you combine those into making some sort of mega why? And I feel like there's an opportunity to do that right now. Um, the other lesson I take out of retrofit is um, it's messy and complicated. Like that, that's the reality of it. Um, does it financially, is it, does it financially stack? That depends on what you're doing. You know, those walk up flat units, given construction costs right now, and we did them a couple of years ago, they're probably half the cost of a new house these days. Um, but damn, they were messy. You know, we, we, we put in solar and battery and we put air conditioning in, we brought the laundries inside, and then you work out the wiring's not good enough because it's 60 years old. And then you work out the main switchboards are not enough. And then you get the call from the SA Power Networks to say, no, 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 hang on, you need a new transformer. Um, so things are messy and complicated. Or you go to put the solar panels on the roof and then you discover the asbestos and that has to be fully replaced. Or the joists in the roof aren't strong enough to hold the solar panels because you're putting lots of solar panels on there. So, um, you know, cheaper, yes. Um, messy and complicated, 100%. But is it better to retain that asset and make it usable? Um, I, would, I would think so. Um, you know, the site that had the video with the solar panels on it, the most interesting thing out of that project is if we knocked that over and wanted to rebuild on it, we couldn't rebuild 48 units because the planning rules have changed. So we wouldn't get the replacement of those public housing outcomes. So where does that leave you? And then it leaves you down kind of the retrospect, ret retrofit path. Um, we're just about to engage some consultants to fully um, evaluate these five projects um, and understand what we get out of it. And I, I can say this, I'm happy to talk to anyone around the country about when we get those outcomes out of that to see, see how it stacks. So I might just add in around the passive house stuff as well, if I can. Um, it obviously is a very high performing standard and performs really well when you get it right. You're absolutely right that in Australia there's it, it, we still don't have enough examples to, for it to be common, but those people who are building in that space kind of have, have learnt after two or three how to get it right. Um, my sense is that there is a slight additional cost, um, but those costs are going to come down. Whether it's the right performance standard for the general housing stock moving forward, I'm not yet convinced. We're not even delivering six star right, let alone trying to push towards those, those highest uh, performance outcomes. And if you get it wrong or you missize things like the mechanical vent yeah. ventilation, 
then you can get some significant issues in terms of health and wellbeing outcomes. Uh, and we do have some examples of where we've, we've kind of seen that in, in place. So um, yes, a very good standard, but I think there's other things that we can probably do and we can probably get, you know, passive house people will say you either go for the full way or you don't go anyway. But I think we can get kind of 80, 90% of the way there uh, cost effectively and still deliver really good outcomes. We also have some uh, emerging examples of passive house retrofit, um, not only in Australia, but around the world as well. So I think the principles can be applied in the retrofit space. Um, in terms of key lessons, I, I think there's just so much we need to do urgently and we just need uh, to translate policy words into action. And I think that for me, if I was to say kind of one key lesson, it would be we need to almost create a new retrofit industry. So rather than having individual players, we need to get people collaborating together so we're not reinventing the wheel. I just wanted to um, remind everyone that it's a virtual session, so even if other people around you can hear you with the questions, just wait for the mic so that um, those who are listening in can hear as well. So you've got a question over there. Hi, I'm Mary and I'm a tenant of Link Wentworth in Sydney. Um, my question is, and I've had this thought for many years, is why hasn't Australia involved itself with um, making recycled rubber tiles, roof tiles? They are sustainable, they are insulative and they are weatherproofing and they're low maintenance. So why hasn't anyone in Australia decided to create that recycling process with rubber tyres. Tyres are everywhere, they have trouble, it's full of landfill, it's in your landfill, it's going all over the place. So is anyone there able to construct a tile, a rubber tile on the roof to, you know, and the heat, you know, I've got ceramic tiles I have circulation and heat problems where I live and therefore I think rubber tiles would help with that and then with insulation it would, you know, so my thought is out there and I'm throwing the idea out. I, I could you. pick that up from an industry or, or our experience uh, in, in innovation and reuse, etc. If you're doing work in your design space, um, we've got... Um, you know, obviously we've got specific standards uh, and um, in specs for how what standard our homes need to be delivered on and performance requirements for how those elements need to, need to perform. Um, I, I would imagine, uh, does your building code have any uh, any you know limitations in terms of innovation and recycled material yeah. and there not a being lot. a minimum a, lot. a minimum standard for how that material needs to perform uh, also uh, to give just you know and, and the other problem area I'm, I agree with you that the whole world needs to get more creative with innovation and reuse of material um, but for that to happen you need a minimum standard for that material um, to 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 be to for it to be designed into a building and to give the construction industry uh, confidence to actually use it and then you've got the warranty and the you know so I, I'm all for what you what you were saying um, I think the, to get to that point uh, your research institutes your um, government your building code they need to really collaborate um, start at the beginning okay what's the problem what do we need to do um, well, we've got all this material coming out of us, okay? And then we need to create that minimum standard we, to give people confidence. The designers can now design it into their builds and the contractors who are building it can use it with no warranty or liability issues. 200% agree with you, but there's a wee while to get there. Mm. Yeah, the industry is very risk averse. Yeah. Policy makers are very risk averse and it takes a long time to get anything approved. kind of approved. Yeah. But what we need to do is we need to find a way to make that process quicker and to encourage innovation. But also we need to be mindful of some of the experiences in the past. So things like flammable cladding, which we're still dealing with and are going to cost billions to fix. We need to make sure that anything new coming into the market has proper checks and balances. But there is so much innovation to be had in this space. And not even just around materials. It's the way we design, the way we construct. Like, why is it that you know, everyone wants a, a bathroom with two vanities in it? These types of things I think we need to challenge in terms of 
what is housing or what could it be, but that includes the materials we use as well. Mm. Steve. Hello there, Steve Bevington, uh, Community Housing Limited. We've been looking at all of this and doing a little bit of it ourselves. Uh, so in terms of the solar battery retrofit experience or so, do you have, have you made an assessment of what the reduction is in the electricity bills of the tenants and have you got an assessment of what the, uh, the government subsidy is and how much investment which is outside of government subsidy and also given the embedded uh, carbon footprint of the batteries have you done assessment of what reduction in the carbon footprint is? Mm -hmm. Uh, the short answer is yes and no, Steve, for a bunch of those things. Um, we, have some, um, we have some tenant information on bills. Um, the challenge is always getting that beforehand, before they put them in, and, and getting tenants to give you copies of their bills. Um, we know anecdotally through some of the work that we do, particularly when we do relocations, um, and people who have tenants have uh, solar and battery installed and then they go to get them installed somewhere else. If you don't install them, they'll tell you what the difference was. Um, in terms of carbon footprint, no, not really. Um, I think we need to do some more work on that. In terms of the investment part of it, I mean, from a government point of view, um, it is reasonably positive. Um, we, you know, we, as a government, we gave them a grant at the start of the project. Um, we then gave them, you know, a largish loan that they were paying back with interest, which they did, um, which probably went a fair way to paying off the grant. So, and, and they paid that out. So, um, you know, financially it must work from their point of view and we got our money back from it. Um, so if that kind of says it kind of works from an investment point of view, but I do think in retrospect, you know, and as we go forward, um, because we've got more phases, um, we can build that evaluation out further. Um, yeah. Hi, um, just want to, uh, maybe this is one for, for Trevor's, but uh, either of you, all of you can answer if you've got a, a thought. Um, you talked about um, the various barriers in terms of retrofits, the trust issues, the culture of the building trades, etc. cetera, um, lack of, and lack of standards, and you mentioned kind of EPCs and, and, and that, and it kind of strikes me that I'm wondering whether we'll ever really have the kind of drivers to get the scale in terms of kind of um, retrofitting kind of happening um, unless we actually have a kind of standard, kind of some kind of EPC, um, some kind of standard certification in, our, in our, all the states. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I don't think we're going to uh, change uh, the industry or, or consumers' knowledge without that kind of um, uh, kind of replicable information, and I think the you know, what's being done in Europe is probably the best example. Although there are other examples of other locations who have tried similar things, from voluntary approaches through to regulator, regulatory approaches, um, but we. Yeah, we are unlikely to see the market shift on its own in the time span that we need it to shift without that kind of approach. And we've been talking about introducing something like this into Australia for the best part of 20 years. And the time to stop talking about it is yesterday. We need this introduced. Um, you know, there's probably others who are more clued in than I am in, at the conference, but my understanding is there are some significant discussions happening about this at the moment. Whether that translates to something, I'm not sure. Uh, but absolutely, I, I, you know, from what we've seen in our research, people are unlikely to change without that kind of requirement. I mean, in South Australia, I know recently that, and I, I suspect it's underway right now, there's some potential consultation around some changes to the Residential Tenancies Act, which would see some declarations need to be made about you know, the condition of the property and what, you know, potentially, you know, I know it's Nathers, but what sort, of, what sort of star rating they are. So, I mean, that, that, that at least is a starting point, but it's certainly, anecdotally, I'm not sure what, how, how, how effective that is in a housing crisis. Um, if you look at a you know, really, really horribly poor condition house in regional South Australia, um, 
what's, what's the enticement or the carrot or the stick for a private landlord to fix that house up and stop it from leaking like a sieve if they can get tenants for it? So what ends you know, up so, happening yeah. in some places in, in Europe now is there is a requirement that when yep. you go to rent, it needs to be a certain... 100%. We get so the that, same. So that's, so that's, the, yeah, yeah, that's the step so towards that, will be, that star rating and lifting it up, is you've got to know what it is. No, 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 no. I'd, correct, 100%. But it's... Yeah, correct. But from a, from a government or a policy position, what, how, do you, how do you work with carrots or sticks with private landlords yeah. to, to put that in place? Yeah, it has to be legislated. story. Correct. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Um, just before I hand over to the next question, I actually have some knowledge about that. I'll jump in. There is actually um, work being done to create a national framework. So there's, um, a, uh, led by ACOS, there's been a joint, um, it's called the National Community Sector Blueprint, and there's been over 80 organisations sign on to look at um, pushing for a national framework for energy efficiency minimum standards uh, for renters, and more broadly, and, and also a national uh, minimum disclosure framework, so all properties need to have a disclosure on what energy rating they are. Uh, and so the federal government was meant to be releasing this year a national framework, so Victoria government was meant to be leading it, but it has been delayed. So it needs more pressure to actually um, see it happen, but there, there's definitely things in the pipeline. Thank you, <laughs> and thank you for the ad. <laughs> um, hello, I'm Robin Sampson, I'm um, from Baptist Care Australia. I had a quick point about Passive House just for the person asking about it, one of our Baptist social service agencies that provides community housing has recently finished a passive house development in Victoria that's particularly aimed at larger families. So if you want to meet the manager of that program, he's here at the conference, but in a different session. Um, but my question for the panel, thank you so much. It's been a really interesting set of perspectives you've brought to this discussion, so thank you. Um, I'm quite interested in um, uh, the possibility of kind of uh, using the circular economy approach when responding to the natural disasters and the impacts that has on housing supply in different areas. Some of our members are now, um, for instance, uh, uh, Baptist Care in New South Wales is running a temporary housing um, site in Lismore because of the number of houses that were lost during the floods. Um, and I'm just interested in how the circular economy concept can be sort of activated in those crisis moments, which is, of course, a terrible moment to be <laughs> having to think about these things. But at some other level, there's an opportunity there. And those opportunities, shall we call them, will continue to come thick and fast in the coming years. So I'm interested in your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, I have a few thoughts. Um, so I don't I don't understand how your sort of construction sector and social housing works. So I don't know if you are acquiring land or or you need to clear land to make way for redevelopment, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so for us, because we are you know getting rid of buildings at the end of life, um, we've been affected by cyclones uh, recently, um, and you know we we have reached out to the teams that are managing those types of crises to say we have we have houses here in a pipeline uh, that that we could make available in terms of priority um, for you. The the other thing that we are thinking about, well, we are actually going to pilot, is um, is some reuse of materials into our into our new build. So one, raw extraction of materials won't happen. We have a yard where all the deconstructed materials, good stuff, is used, um, and where the building code allows, so non-structural, you know, we could help with, um, you know, fencing, landscaping, retaining walls, concrete, you know, like there's, there's so much opportunity um, in a, in a I suppose for us, we had, you know, as a result of COVID, COVID and maybe similarly you, um, shortages of material, etc. cetera. Well, if we have a stockyard of material that, you know, even if it's just temporary accommodation, um, you know, villages or what have you to help with, with cyclones or crisis, um, that, that's got to be a starting point. Um, that's my thoughts on it anyway. I know we're, we're going to pilot some of that. Yeah, I think... Um uh, there's so many opportunities to better prepare uh, our built environment, both to respond to, uh, but also build back from some of these events. And I think that means 
looking into, yeah, how do you design and build faster, but also higher quality and potentially even making housing relocatable if you know, you know the, yeah. there's a high chance of a flood, <laughs> can we move some of the housing or, or, or do something? And I think that we're going to need to think outside the box moving forward over the coming decades to make sure that we're not having to rebuild back community after community any time there's a natural disaster. We just can't afford to do that. We don't have the resources to do that. But also in terms of the social impact for those communities, there's only so much people can take before they will break. And so I think anything we can do within the built environment to protect the housing and other infrastructure, um, the better it's going to be. And I think circular economy certainly offers us ways there in, in, in how to do that. I think to fully maximise it though, we're going to need to see changes to the building regulations to allow us to reuse materials in ways that they're not currently allowed to be, to, to be used. Uh, Frank Tambora from Brick Housing. Um, excellent topic and um, great discussion and probably just to that last point. Um, my, my question is about um, uh, around how we build more resilient and flexible housing and um, speaking to design guidelines, um, yeah. we often see how um, we get to a point, something to the end of its life and we decide to tear it down. I mean, um, perfect example in this, uh, in this state, we have a perfectly good stadium and we're going to just demolish it. But it's this old thinking that we, you know, it's no longer fit and we, we you know, it comes to the end of the life and, and just because we can, we tear it down. Yeah. Whereas, um, um, you know, we don't have any sort of uh, uh, control mechanism in terms of environmental impact and what the, that means. But how do we design homes that are flexible that in the future that instead of um, tearing it down, it's modular that we can uh, uh, flex it up, flex yeah. it down as the circumstances change, be able to have designs in our property, in our uh, construction that adapts, is adaptable to that. So we're no longer going to this point of, you know, 50 years, let's just wipe it out and let's start again. We just keep, you know, having to build those, get those materials back. And, and these materials, these finite resources are, are becoming more scarce and limited. So I think the question is, where is some of those policies around the, the, the environmental part? Um, yeah. What are you seeing uh, that's being discussed? And in those sort of future designs, if there's ever, if there is, um, already um, any consultations around that sort of um, design frameworks? Yeah, I mean, I, I think at some stage government has to be, go, various different governments have to be leaders in this space. And on some level that'll be driven by uh, plans around how you're tackling climate change and carbon emissions. Um, once you set those targets, um, then you have to work to those and you have to find solutions. Um, then in and around that, you know, there'll be obviously challenges around building code approvals and planning approvals, but there's no reason why you can't achieve that. Um, we were doing some work recently on, you know, an apartment site and we were looking to use, you know, cross laminated timber. And one of the things we were looking at in that building was to enable our apartment designs to have interior non-structural walls that you could move. So if you started off with, I don't know, single person, um, then becomes a couple and with a child you could move the wall instead of having open plan office, you create a second bedroom. Um, so so there, are, there are options out there. Um, I think the other interesting one, and this is just completely anecdotal, but it's probably a reflection of construction costs. I can think of three or four buildings in Adelaide right now that are just redoing their facades. You know, commercial buildings where they're just redoing the facades because they know building it again is going to be extremely expensive. Now, the added benefit is you're not knocking it down and creating waste and creating more carbon as you rebuild it again. But, you know, there are ways, particularly on that sort of scale, um, where you can keep the shell and redo, you know, redo the outside. You can also refit the inside. So there's no, why, there's no reason why that can't apply to residential buildings. Um, I think the discussion this morning you know, get, gets a little bit stuck about the, the use of the word modular. Um, I'd probably lean more towards the word prefab. Um, and I think prefab leads itself to pods and additions and things that can come and go. We've certainly done some work in that space in the APY lands. 
um, where we've in essence added on extra bedrooms to the sides of houses. Um, so it is about getting your designs right um, and your construction techniques right um, and then you can, you, you can make it happen. Um, you know, I think the challenge for us in government and in the room is just experiment and try things out and push the barrow forward in that sense. Yeah, I would agree, actually. Um, I don't know if you use the term piloting here, but um, a, a, lot of our, a lot of what we've done through, through my program, start off small, try it once or twice, try it, try it in different regions, um, measure it. Um, and so then you're making evidence-based decisions. Uh, I think it's, it's people try to scale up too quickly or think, oh, no, we, ca we can't try that. Start simple, do one. You know, build up slowly, do another. Um, it's, it's possible. I really like piloting, some people don't, but it um, helps you make evidence-based decisions and, and it makes it less scary to start because you're only starting, you know, singular or, or small scale. Give it a go. <laughs> I would say we need to see changes in the regulation. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be a broken record on this, but we know that the regulations are now changing every three years, so we have limited opportunities to inform that. My understanding is we've missed 2025 for significant changes in the residential space and that the next big change will be 2028. Hopefully there's going to be discussions about embodied carbon yep. there and then that will shift the discussion to how do we make sure we leverage this at the end of life or extend that. But also you know, we need to make sure that those people involved in the design process are thinking about this is not just you know for the first five years of the, the the house is going to be used but this is going to be here 50 or 100 years or more um, but what happens if it's no longer fit for purpose and i don't think that we're going to keep all our you know existing eight million houses that you know i flagged earlier that need to be retrofitted there's going to be some that either shouldn't be retrofitted because they're in too poor a quality or it makes sense to knock down and build at higher density in some of those locations but the challenge is it takes more thinking and more nuanced considerations of things like the joinery yeah. and these types of things. So we need to have those discussions with everyone throughout the industry and say, okay, what is the best way of doing this and how do we make this industry standard so that when we come to the end of life, we can pull these things apart or we can relocate them or do whatever, but we don't go, oh, it's all stuck together. We can't do anything. We just throw it out in the tip. Mm -hmm. And so I think that regulation will have a really key role to play there. 100%. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm Rachel Goldlust from Renew. My question's for Dr Moore about your ARC research. I was just curious, I know you said you're in the last stages of, but I'm curious about, you know, your policy suggestions and where you're going to be firing them and where you think you're going to get the best kind of output for the work you've done because in our work in residential elect electrification, we've identified a lot of the same barriers and problems in the industry but it's about breaking through into actual policy outcomes that everyone's eagerly anticipating. <laughs> yes, and we actually have a policy workshop coming up in a couple of weeks' time, so uh, my answer will, will shift in, in due course, but um, you know, I, I think there's some really clear things that we're going to be taking to those discussions around you know, the need for minimum information for housing consumers to begin with, so something like the e e EPC, the Energy Performance Certificate, is going to be really important for helping to, to, to shift the industry. Um, but also I think that there is going to be some sort of facilitation mechanism needed to try and bring people in the industry together so people start working collectively rather than individually. Um, and so that will, will require changes at, at, at different kind of levels. Um, a lot of the stuff you know, that we're finding with retrofit is the same for, for any kind of going to all electric, as you say, is the same as what people were talking about with installing solar, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. These are not necessarily new problems or even new information. Um, and what we're struggling with is how do we translate this into real action? And the government, you know, so, so one of the, our partners is the Victorian government, um, you know, they're obviously struggling with, we need to build more housing, we need to build, try and build sustainable housing, we need to, you know, provide public housing, how do we do all these things when their budget is, is sh shot? And so we're struggling, if I'm honest, in how to translate this into here are a series of short-term actions. Um, it m is more around what can we do probably in the medium to longer term, 
but trying to bring that urgency in and trying to, you know, Renew's a perfect organisation to go, we have this information, right? We're not reinventing the wheel. Yeah. We've got examples like Cape Patterson Eco Village and, and others that you can freely go in and get their house plans and build to a much higher standard. And even the same with retrofit. We have examples of how to, to do this. It is just how do you kind of get all those ducks in a row to make sure there's change? And my sense is that government is hesitant to regulate further. They want consumers to change. Consumers are not going to change unless regulated to do so. The industry is not going to change unless regulated to do so. So we're in a stalemate. So I will be pushing for regulatory changes. And even if it's as simple as making sure that you know, rental housing has minimum performance yep. requirements because that's 30% of the sector. And if you can lift that, then you start to lift, change the rest of the industry. Um, one more thing on that is that Healthy Homes for Renters is a national network coordinating advocacy on this lobby stuff. Renew is a member. Um, so that they all, that community sector blueprint, they were part of pulling that together. And also to remind everyone that you could add this into your submissions for the National Housing and Homelessness Plan due on the 20th of October. Okay, next question. How genuinely motivated are government bodies to actually put sustainable stuff in social housing? Having dealt with social, deal with social housing for work, even just getting fans, like you've got these older buildings that have got no fans, it's really hot, and to get anything added to it, you've got to get permission, and the tenant has to pay. And for someone who's in yeah. lower, you know, that sort of bracket, it's just not affordable, but you're you're essentially say, putting the cost onto the people that can't afford it when it would just be easier if you just provided that for them and got them on board. It just seems like there's a lot of policy and regulation that is beneficial to the people that it's not going to, that, that it could impact, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, I feel like you've put the cheese with peanut butter on the mousetrap for me there. Um, so I will premise this by saying this is my views, not my government's views. Y yes, correct. 100%. Like, I, I, I've worked in a few different areas in public and community housing. Um, to find out that we don't put fans in our homes is kind of like, really? Are you serious? You know, like, now, I then get into arguments in the kitchen about, you know, people that have got injured because there was a fan in a house. And it might have happened once 40 years ago, so we never put fans in. Um, don't get me started on the rules about blinds and curtains and floor coverings that cover community housing in South Australia. I don't understand some of those things. Um, but I think, yeah, my personal view is we need to tackle some of those things. And, and it goes to your point around, you know, solar and battery comes in and, and those that are wealthy and those that are middle class can afford to put those things in. What's government's role in helping people that are low socioeconomic, making sure they don't miss out on those things? Um, what's our role in helping with those things to make those people's lives better? Perhaps, you know, they have more financial capability to lift themselves up, more capability to pay their rent. Um, you know, so there, there, there's a cycle to it. How do we, you know, one of the challenges with solar and battery for us is, you know, I put it on my home, I get a payback period. I can sit there and work it out. Um, I talk to, you know, our finance guy in the back there. Imagine what, how that conversation goes when I don't put payback period on the table. Yeah, we're just going to put solar and battery in there and the tenant gets a cheaper bill. Cool. So, you know, that, that's part of the reason why we're about to invest in some serious evaluation on this, because I want to understand those things. Like, is rent arrears less in those homes? You know, like, one of the things we did with those walk-up flat sites is they were kind of 30 to 40% empty before we did this work because nobody wanted to live in them because they were terrible. So there's no rental income coming there. So how do, what, what does that look like? So we're better off financially now that they're full. Um, people want to live there. You talk about the social benefits of some of this stuff. The social benefit for us on those walk-up flat sites is people want to live in them now. Um, we've got a housing crisis and people want to move in. Cool, I've got a flat, it's got air conditioning, it's got appliances, it's even got a laundry inside, um, and solar and battery. So yeah, I, yeah. Where do we start? I mean, we just, you know, we bring our personal views to the table and then we try and have a conversation and we try and shift some of those policy things. I mean, you know, when the temperature's risen, whatever it's risen in 15 years' time and it's 54 degrees in a public 
housing dwelling in Port Augusta, um, you know, should we have air conditioning then? I don't know. You know, like that's the, you know, they're the questions we have to be asking ourselves in terms of is it safe and is it healthy for our tenants to live in those homes? Um, I don't know. Sorry. I, yeah. And, and I think it's really important that we get the evidence. Yeah. So we, we evaluated some nine stay houses for the Victorian government well, probably 10 years ago now. And the comparison in the middle of a heat wave, so the temperature was up at 45 degrees over a few days and probably not dropping down below about 25, 26 overnight. The nine star houses without air conditioning were like 15 degrees cooler than the six star or apparent six star housing with some sort of air conditioning. And so you're already talking about so much better quality and performance there. But the challenge is for you know, social public housing providers is we need more housing. We need that to be higher performance and higher quality. So how do we do that when you've got constrained budgets? Um, I do recognise it is now time for uh, bringing the session to a close. Uh, thank you everyone for a fascinating uh, discussion there. I'm sure the panel will continue to have discussions with anyone should they, they wish to have those. Um, we're now heading into the afternoon tea, which is in the exhibition precinct, and then there'll be a 3.30 plenary to rental systems, international perspective session in this room. For those online, we'll see you again for the final session in 30 minutes, but if everyone could thank the panel for me before you all rush off.